uh, directions in X, Y, and Z. Now this model is exactly solvable. And when it is solved, it predicts the excitations of certain types of excitations known as Majorana fermions. Not only that, there are many of that sort. We will come to what to explain slightly better way what they are in the next few slides. But what I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> the honeycomb lattice, if prepared as a two dimensional layer with interesting magnetic atoms sitting at the vertices has very interesting properties in terms of uh, novel excitations. And one of the major models that explains it is the Kitaev model. Now, what does that mean? Now, we take a step back and look at what we know about quasi-particles. These are excitations. So in, 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 in normal quantum mechanics, or basic quantum mechanics, we talk about exchange of two particles, indistinguishable particles, psi one and psi two. And we learn that if you just exchange uh, indistinguishable particles, all it adds to the, to the combined ket vector psi one, psi two is, an, uh, is a phase factor, e raised to i phi. And that's what it does. If the particles that you talk about are bosons, then that phase factor becomes one. And if they're fermions, they are anti-symmetrical and it becomes minus one. And this is textbook information. Now, if you have two dimensions, uh, for reasons which are not shown here, all of a sudden this e raised to i theta phase factor can take any values between one and minus one. It means that when you exchange these particles, it actually picks up a phase factor. Now, this, the, the, the equation shown in the middle of the slide is the general equation. And all of a sudden the Fermi Dirac statistics emerges if theta is pi and uh, the Bose-Einstein would emerge if the theta is zero to pi. Somewhere in between is a general statistics. And that statistics belongs to what are known as anions. It is proposed uh, a little, uh, a, a decade or two back um, by a couple of European physicists. And it belongs to what is known as fractional statistics. There is elaborate math for that. Uh, I, I don't know much about those things, but, but what is important is to know that there is a class of quasi-particles with a phase factor if you have two dimensional systems. And why is it important? Because um, <clears throat> people have actually started to observe them in two dimensional. So this is nothing but what you see at the center is nothing but uh, gallium arsenide uh, doped with something, something. Uh, it forms uh, a two dimensional electron gas. Think of it as just a very thin layer of an object, of a material of gallium and arsenic. And then there is an electron gas in, in, in it, which you can control by applying voltages and uh, you can pass currents and you can do uh, some experiments. And people have done that experiment very recently, published in, uh, in the magazine Science. They have the first indication of fractional statistics in anion collisions. It assumes even more importance because you can have many more excitations in two dimensional uh, systems and the anions form what is known as one route to topological quantum computing. Because you know that quantum computing is a booming topic. People are trying to make quantum computers. Uh, so Microsoft, Google, Honeywell, they are all trying their own quantum computers. They are trying different routes. One of the oldest and famous route is quantum computing using atoms. So you cool down uh, a collection of few collection of atoms. You make an atom trap, you make a condensate and stuff like that. And you can actually manipulate them to do uh, calculations on uh, bits and bytes. And you can, you can make a quantum computer with the quantum mechanical uh, state functions. Now, anions is just another way of doing it, but it's much more tougher and much more complex. So the 
the bottom line is that in two dimensional, there can be very new quasi particles and they might obey or they do obey a different type of statistics than Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein. And how do we observe them? It's most likely a quantum Hall effect, a different types of quantum Hall effect. So that is the very elaborate introduction. I wanted, I hope it helped to set the, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> introduction in place so that you know what, what's fancier about these things. What people like I do, I, by which I mean people who work on strongly correlated systems and quantum magnets in bulk form, we try to explore magnetic systems which might indicate that they have a ground state from which an anion can emerge. There have been some work uh, on similar systems. I'll show you two notable examples. One is a compound known as Herbert Smithite. The picture that you see is a naturally occurring Herbert Smithite because it has its fancy name because it is observed by somebody called Herbert Smith and the compound is known as Herbert Smithite. And you can see the major element, the magnetic element in that compound, in that chemical formula is copper. And copper has been half, so it's a quantum mechanical system. And not only that, copper forms a Kagome lattice in this compound. So as I shown in a previous slide, the Kagome lattice is a two dimensional lattice with triangles. So people studied, so there is a group in uh, uh, Dan Nocera's group, I think in uh, Cornell. They studied this compound and they found excitations with, which are known as fractionalized excitations. And why fractionalized? Fractionalized because you see here, this is uh, uh, the image on the right bottom is nothing but the observation of fractional quantum Hall effect. And it's nothing but a plot of resistivity, rho x, y. So it's in, it's in two dimensional plane is on the y axis and a magnetic field in Tesla on the x axis. And you see that sharp jumps occur at fractional values. And those fractional values are not the values of the magnetic field, but it's a fractional value of electron filling in that material on which they measure the resistivity. It means that the electrons are the constituent in that material, but they show some interesting properties when those electrons form a quasi particle with a fractional value, because we don't really see a half of an electron, but electrons somehow bind together in a quasi particle and they have, they can have behave like a particle with three and a half electrons, with five and a half electrons. And that is a fractional excitation. In this compound, uh, people use neutron scattering, which is uh, an experimental tool I also use. And they found a magnetic contribution and they could explain the excitations only based on uh, a fractionalized charges. And that is, is one of the connection that I wanted to make. Another very important material is, of course, uh, has a honeycomb lattice. It's formed by ruthenium, uh, is a transition metal, and then it forms a honeycomb. So if you look at the left hand side, extreme left uh, crystal structure diagram, you can see a honeycomb and the red atoms are ruthenium. So if you look at the red circles, uh, spheres, you would see a honeycomb. The middle diagram is a measurement of energy on the y-axis and reciprocal lattice spacing on the x-axis. It is nothing but a map of energy transmit, transferred by neutrons to the sample when they hit it. So it's a color map at five Kelvin showing what happens if you bombard the sample with neutrons and transfer energy to the spins. 
And people have very recently found that it has what is known as a spin liquid ground state and proposes that some sort of fancy excitations come out of this. They are known as Majorana fermions. And they are quasi particles similar to the anions, but then they have they are described by a real wave function. So you know that in quantum mechanics, we often have complex wave functions for everything, but then Majorana fermions have real wave functions, which means that a Majorana fermion is its own antiparticle. So it's particle and antiparticle at the same time. <clears throat> You can observe it in, in, in a compound like uh, alpha ruthenium chloride. And that's the uh, uh, interest, that's the uh, strong physics behind it. So before I get into uh, uh, the real uh, results, um, I will give you a glossary of important terms. Uh, the first one is fractionalization. It means that quasi-particles of a system uh, the, do not have to appear as if they are constructed by through a combination of elementary constituents, which means you can have a quasi-particle with three and a half electron charge, five and a half. That's, that's nothing but the fractional quantum Hall effect. Another important thing is a quantum spin liquid. It's an unusual phase of matter where you have at very, even at very low temperatures, the magnetic moments do not order, but then they would have a long range entanglement of spins. So you have a single wave function uh, and you have from that ground state, you can have fractional excitations. Uh, <clears throat> you can have other types of order known as uh, pneumatic order. It's nothing but uh, an order which is in one or two dimensions where uh, you know the spin correlations have a dimensionality of a single line or a single, uh, uh, in fact, it's a single line. <clears throat> and it can directly apply to electrons and magnetic moments also, though it is discovered in uh, uh, liquid crystals. Another term is uh, Heisenberg and XY order. It just means that the magnetic moments can rotate in any plane in three-dimensional space if it is Heisenberg. And if it is XY, they are constrained to a two-dimensional layer or two-dimensional plane. So these are some types of magnetic order which are uh, oftenly observed. <clears throat> now we come to uh, the, the problem at hand. We want to investigate frustrated magnetism in a honeycomb lattice with effective spin half on this particular compound. Now, we already established that the honeycomb lattice can, can really support frustrated magnetism. So that this compound, barium cobalt phosphate, has a honeycomb lattice. It is the lattice of the cobalt atoms. Now, so that makes it frustrated magnetism in a honeycomb lattice. Now, how come we have S effective is equal to half? Because cobalt should have three halves or so spin. The spin effective half comes about because of the uh, crystal field splitting, because cobalt, if you look at the center, the blue figure, the cobalt two plus is in an octahedral coordination of oxygen ions, which are shown in red. So the cobalt atom is sitting at a location where it is surrounded by the negative charges of oxygen in an octahedra, and this forms nothing but uh, uh, something similar to what you already know as Stark effect. So it's a, it's a magnetic moment or an atom in an electric field. So it, it, it is a, 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 the direct effect of Stark effect and the atomic levels of cobalt would split up because it will remove its degeneracy and the ground state would be a J half separated from the next highest level of three halves by very high margin of energy. So you can consider that J as an effective pseudo spin of half. So that makes it an ideal constitution, uh, a component. We have a honeycomb lattice of cobalt, we have a quantum mechanical spin half, and we have geometrical frustration. So this could be an ideal situation to 
study if it forms a quantum spin liquid or if it has some fancy excitations, anions, things like that. Now that we have <clears throat> now that we have identified the compound, we want to know if there is any theoretical models that exist to explain these kind of physics. And there are a couple of models. There is a classical model which explains the J1, J2, J3 are the J parameters which I introduced in the Kitaev model. In the Kitaev model, you will notice that they were on the edges of the honeycomb itself. Now here, they are not on the edges, but they are through uh, you know, direct nearest neighbor connection from a central uh, atom in the honeycomb lattice. So this model has a Hamiltonian shown uh, at the left top corner. And if you have an energy constraint saying that J1 by two is equal to J2 is equal to J3, you would have a maximally frustrated point and it can form a spin liquid. So there is already a theoretical work existing that it could form a disordered ground state, which may support a spin liquid. There is also a quantum version of this, in which case you can have two types of interactions. On the left-hand side, it's antiferromagnetic, and on the right-hand side, it is ferromagnetic. Now, uh, don't get disheartened by what the, you know, the several kinds of tiny diagrams that you see here. All it means is that you see the different types of uh, honeycomb pictures shown on either side, each of them, each quadrant of them are different arrangements of spin. So in some cases they are collinear and in some case, cases they are non-collinear. It means that you can see very tiny arrows on the vertices of these honeycombs. So in some cases they all point in one direction, in some cases they all point in different directions. Now. What is on the X and Y axis? The X and Y axis are nothing but J1, J2, and J3 normalized to J1 so that you can represent three numbers on a two-dimensional plane. It tells you that if I somehow tune J1 and J2, which is the interaction between the, the spins on the honeycomb, I can get different types of magnetic structures. And the thin blue line marks the boundary between different phases. So this is nothing but a phase diagram, very similar to the phase diagram of water, for example. So that you, you have a similar uh, uh, line diagram uh, for the phase diagram of water. And you would say that in one region, you have ice, one region, you have uh, everything coexisting, and then one region, you have water and so on. Very similar here just that you have different magnetic structures. So all these two slides shows that some kind of theoretical work has been already done and magnetic structures are predicted. Now, the blue lines themselves are regions of high frustration and disorder. And those are the regions that we are interested in. We want to know if our material, this particular compound, would go and fall in one of those uh, narrow regions of blue lines. If so, then it is highly frustrated and it, it can have a very fascinating uh, magnetic ground state. All right, so now we prepared this compound in a particular way. Uh, it's called a hydrothermal synthesis. It takes several chemicals and mix them into, uh, dissolve them in water seal it in a Teflon uh, autoclave, uh, lined stainless steel autoclave, and then you heat it to 200 degrees Celsius or 300 degrees Celsius for a couple of days. And if every parameter worked fine, then you would get crystals. And the image shows some sort of crystals that we got. You can already see that uh, they are pink in color because of cobalt, and they already have, the good ones already have a honeycomb shape. So it's, it, it, it already shows the crystal structure is coming out onto the morphology of the crystal. Now, 
It is important to get the correct phase of this compound. Why? Because this compound has polymorphism, which means that depending on how you prepare, you might end up getting a totally different crystal structure. Whereas we are interested in the gamma phase only, which is R minus three space group on the right hand side of the uh, image. So we want only that and not the other two on the left. So there is a special way of doing, controlling it. And that's what we did to avoid having the other two phases and getting the, the gamma phase, which is the, uh, the R minus three space group structure. Once we get a crystal, then we try to study its structure with X-ray diffraction uh, and analysis using what is known as a re uh, refinement method and confirm the space group. So that's what we did. We index each of these peaks and that would correspond to special occupation of uh, crystallographic positions by the atoms. And we could verify that the compound actually crystallizes in R3 bar, the hexagonal structure, uh, which is the honeycomb structure. Now, we also found out from this that the separation between cobalt and cobalt along the C axis is about seven angstrom, which is good because it, it already imparts some sort of two dimensionality to the layers of cobalt. So, uh, I'll have to agree that if you say it's not two dimensional because it's already a crystal, but that is true. We are looking only at the cobalt layers, which are seven angstrom separated. So it is not essentially very accurate as two dimension, but it is, I would say it is quasi two dimensional. Once that is done, um, we used high resolution X-rays of uh, smaller wavelength and higher energies. So that's a synchrotron radiation to study what kind of structural defects exist. So what is the reason for that? The reason is that we want to know if these layers are perfectly flat or if they have some defects like stacking fault, like uh, um, some kind of buckling that um, the layers are deformed and disordered. And indeed there is some sort of um, uh, slight indication. Uh, there is a broadening of the X-ray peak, as you can see on the panel C and D. Uh, it means that there is some sort of uh, uh, disorder, but we could not quantify them. But there was no sign of stacking fault. Uh, if there was a stacking fault, we would see that as a very broad feature at low two theta. So maybe below a two theta of five degrees or 10 degrees, you would see a very broad feature. And in panel A, we don't see anything like that. In some of the batches though, we find that there is a propensity of some sort of impurity formation, uh, but that impurity is of no consequence to the physics that we are investigating because that impurity actually has a phase transition at very high temperature and it forms some sort of glassy phase transition. So we are not worried about that. And it occurred only in some batches. <clears throat> now, once the structure is determined, we want to know what kind of magnetic properties it exhibits. So the best way it is to measure the magnetic susceptibility as a function of temperature. And that's a plot that you see now the magnetic susceptibility increases as a function of reducing temperature. It goes through a broad maximum and then it would decrease again. Now, we cannot say much from this uh, about what type of magnetic ordering or magnetic ground state it might form, but we can say that it's not a sharp transition. It's a broad transition. And most of the times the broad transition would indicate some sort of uh, disordered ground state. If I take a derivative or something, I see two, two uh, uh, transition temperatures, which are anomalies in the derivative of chi versus T. One is at five Kelvin, another one is at 3.5 Kelvin. So both are at very low temperatures. And if I increase the field, which you can see in the inset, the peak gets smoothed out. 
So that is a classical indication of ferromagnetic correlations because you apply the field, the spins would align more and more in the same directions and you would get a smoothed out uh, curve where the magnetization is slightly increasing. Now we try to vary the frequency of the uh, uh, applied um, the microwave, the, sorry, the, the frequency of uh, AC field that we apply to measure the susceptibility to see if there was some sort of dependence of the peak with the frequency. And why would we do that? Uh, we do that because if there was such a dependence, then that would indicate that the ground state is what is known as a spin glass state. Uh, it would then indicate that uh, the ground state would have long time spin relaxations. And uh, you can then use certain type of power laws to explain uh, the whole phenomena of um, uh, frequency dependence. So in this particular case, even though we varied the frequency uh, over a couple of uh, decades, uh, there was no such frequency dependence. All the curves fall on top of each other. If you measure specific heat, you would see clearer indication of the two anomalies at around five or six Kelvin and around four Kelvin, which is more clear in specific heat. And we, the two uh, curves, black and red on the main panel, just shows that uh, we measured on two different samples. One is annealed and one is non-annealed. And the reason why we did that is to check if by annealing, if we can remove the defects. Um, we saw broadening of X-ray peaks and that is the defect that I'm referring to here. Now, if I do calculate the magnetic specific heat out of this uh, uh, total specific heat, I see indication of magnetic uh, specific heat or entropy existing all the way to 40 Kelvin or so. So which means that the ordering, the entropy is not completely removed at Tn or Tn1 or Tn2, but it exists even up to high temperatures. It means that the spin fluctuations or the correlation functions are relevant even at those high temperatures. And it doesn't come and saturate at a value of R log two. Why did I take R log two? Because it's a spin half system. So, so the total magnetic entropy should level off at two uh, S plus one, R, R, R log S plus S plus two S plus one. So that doesn't happen at the temperatures where the phase transition occurs, which is below 10 Kelvin. It happens only at 40 Kelvin. So, <clears throat> then we try to do um, a direct estimation and determination of magnetic structures. And for that, we do neutron diffraction experiments at uh, national labs. Uh, for example, we did at um, NIST uh, Neutron Center. Um, this is nothing but a scattering experiment. So the schematic shows that you have a sample in that area marked by a circle and the incoming arrow indicated k is the wave vector of the incoming neutrons that's nothing but 2 pi by lambda so it's it's some it's in a way the energy of the incoming neutrons and then it would get scattered from that circle and it would go to uh, you know become k prime which is the scattered uh, neutron so it's like a collision of uh, spherical balls that you study in classical dynamics. It's a very, very weak comparison, but that's what it is. Uh, and these circles at the right end are the detectors. Now, if you look at the image here, uh, the, the image shows in the yellow uh, semicircle are actually those detectors that you see here. So the neutrons come somewhere from the left extreme. It would hit the sample. And it would go to one of these, uh, you know, yellow uh, semicircle area, and it has inside of it has several detectors. So that's what we measure. So we know the value of k, we know the value of k prime, and we know how much angle it is where the detector. So the detector is just 
uh, you know measures clicks when it when a, when a when a photon comes and hits it you measure a click so that's what it does with this information you can actually determine crystal and magnetic structures so the data that you get out of it looks like this um, it's very similar to an x-ray diffraction pattern and you have intensity as a function of q which is k minus k prime and that is in inverse angstroms with this data we actually confirmed all the results that we saw on the previous x-ray diffraction analysis it means that it is honeycomb it has r3 structure and you see a and b are four angstroms and the c axis which is perpendicular to the honeycomb layers is 23 and that means that translates to about seven or eight angstrom separation between the cobalt layers, which makes it two dimensional. Now, from that data, we subtract the, uh, the, the 4.7 Kelvin uh, and 10 Kelvin data, because the 10 Kelvin data is already above the phase transition. So we subtract that data to see pure magnetic contribution. And now you see that there are broader peaks indicated by that red line. So the, the broader the peak in any diffraction data, you should understand that there is more disorder, more glassiness. And if the peaks are sharp, then it's more uh, long range order and uh, uh, translational symmetry is not uh, disturbed. There are less defects and such. So here we see broader peaks. Now, with these broader peaks, we are able to determine two characteristics length scales. One, that of a helical structure at low Q, and one, a collinear structure at high Q. And the red line that you see is actually a complicated function, which is given on the right-hand side. But all it means is that it mimics what is known as a uh, an excitation in, in a metallic liquid. So it's developed for some sort of uh, liquid-like systems. Uh, and we see the ex exactly similar behavior in our magnetic system, which means that our magnetic system is not actually uh, completely long range order, but there are some regions where the spins behave like a liquid. And what is the characteristic length of that liquid? It's about 350 plus or minus 11 angstrom. That's a correlation length. So, <clears throat> so we identify two ordering. One is helical and one is collinear. And we also see that there is some sort of uh, liquid-like uh, correlations in the system, which is of the order of 350 angstrom. So there are, you can think of it as like loop, or like, like pools of 350 angstrom domains within the system. So this is a clearer depiction of those two different wave vectors. So a wave vector would only indicate that what type of ordering you have. So if you have a helical ordering, that corresponds to a Q0, which is the ordering wave vector of 0.374, and a collinear order, uh, and the wave vector is half zero zero. For the helical, it is 0 0.2500 and 0 0.146, 0 0.1460. And they have a sort of evolution as a function of temperature. So you can see that as the temperature goes to close to 1.7 Kelvin, they peak up. And above 4 Kelvin, the helical peak is almost uh, smoothed out. That's not so in the case of collinear structure. In the case of collinear structure, the peak formation begins already by six Kelvin or seven Kelvin. It means that one of these orders set in at a higher temperature, and then the helical order would set in at much lower temperature. So how does the magnetic structure or the spin structure would look like? This is not the exact image. This is just a representation. This is just a cartoon. 
So the the collinear order where everything is in a line, collinear means everything is in, in, in a line. So you can see that all the spins point along a particular line. So you have a line of spins pointing up, then the line of spins pointing down, another one pointing up, likewise. This structure develops below 4.7 Kelvin. And then you further cool down the sample and in some other region of the sample, you would have this type of an ordering, which is completely uh, non-collinear. So it's in, in, in random order, but it is, but it is helical. So it, it, in some direction, it would look like a helix. And that develops only below 2.7 Kelvin. With this information, we go back to the phase diagram we had before, and we extract the J1, J2 values through a, a certain type of modeling. I'm not showing it here, but with those values, it implies that this particular compound lies in this blue dark line, which I'm showing here, it's, it's somewhere there. So it, it is in the border of one of these phases. <clears throat> so we estimated the Q1, Q2 parameters from all this data use that to estimate the J1, J2, J3 parameters. With those parameters, we try to pinpoint the location of this particular compound. That's what we did. Once we had this information, we went to look for magnetic excitations. Why? Because we want to know if there is any fancy excitation like uh, an anion or like something of that sort. So you measure what is known as spin waves. The previous scattering experiment is different because that is an elastic scattering event because there is no change in energy uh, that we are going to measure. So it is completely elastic. The energy of the incoming neutron is the same as the energy of the outgoing neutron in that case. In this case, it's different. You can have two cases of neutron loss or neutron gain. So it becomes inelastic neutron scattering. And this is required to know what type of excitations exist and what type of quasi particles are there. We do that for our compound and you see this nice color maps. There are two sets of color maps. Uh, the first row of color maps, each of them is measured at a different temperature. So 1.7, 3.7, 5.7, and 40. They are all measured at a single incoming energy of 3.7 MeV, milli electron volt, for the neutron. And the color map shows that the intensity, wherever you see a color of red or orange, there is very high intensity. And wherever you see a blue or purple, you have very low intensity. So you can see that at 1.7 Kelvin, the high intensity region is somewhere at very low Q and at energies 1 MeV or like 1.8 MeV or 1.5 or 1 MeV. As you go to high Q, a Q is nothing but remember it's a difference between K and K prime. So it tells you how much momentum is transferred to the sample. At higher momentum, there is no excitations at 1.7 K. As you increase the temperature, you would see that it becomes very, very broad. Okay. Now, whenever you see an excitation at very low Q, they are all magnetic excitations. Whenever you see something at high Q, they are from the lattice, they are phonons. The low Q are magnons. Now, if you increase the energy of incoming neutrons to 14.9, you see that the magnetic excitations now extend to slightly higher Q value, which is natural because you have increased the energy of the incoming neutrons. And you see something similar in 1.7 K. And then as you increase the temperature, it becomes very broad and goes away. So there are excitations at low temperature and they are at about 1 MeV and 1.5 MeV. Now we try to model them. Um, so this section actually is a brief overview of what kind of modeling we did. 
the image A is a zoom of the 3.7 MeV uh, neutron incident case uh, at 1.7 Kelvin. And if you zoom in, you can actually see two peaks, and I have indicated it with two uh, horizontal red lines. So those are the two peaks probably emerging uh, as excitations at low temperature at three point very low energy exit, uh, excitations. When you increase the energy, they sort of merge into one line and that's the white line on the image panel B. So at around two MeV, you can see that there is a white line and that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's the excitation that we are talking about. It sort of like merges into one. Uh, Plus, if you increase slightly higher temperature, 3.7 Kelvin, remember that this temperature is between the temperatures where the helical and the collinear orders develop. So you should not see one of them. And in fact, we don't. At 3.7 Kelvin, we don't see the, collinear, uh, the helical order because that order develops only below that temperature. So it's not yet there. Now, with this information, we can actually model using linear spin wave theory, which is nothing but calculating this intensity map or simulating that intensity map using the Hamiltonian, which is given at the top. Remember, this Hamiltonian is same as the J1, J2, J3 model, which we introduced in the beginning introduction section. And you can simulate this pattern using different values of J, and then you are essentially sampling the phase space, J1, J2, J3 phase space, which is given on the right, uh, right bottom. Now, if we have these specific values, J1, J2, J3, and lambda, which, which is a parameter that combines these, uh, for two different sets of J values, we get uh, remarkable matches between the experimentally observed and the uh, simulation patterns. So it is it leads to slight confusion because one of them is more Heisenberg-like and one of them is XY-like. So we are unable to actually pinpoint if it is a purely two-dimensional system, because one of the Heisenberg-like system also confirms to the uh, simulated pattern matching with the experimental data. So that's slightly inconclusive. Nevertheless, we have a better estimation of location of this compound in the J1, J2 phase diagram. It actually puts it as a highly frustrated system it is quantum mechanical system of effective spin half. So it's, uh, it, it, it belongs to a highly frustrated quantum uh, magnet with two short range ordering temperatures at six or five Kelvin and four or 3.5 Kelvin. And they are not related by symmetry because one is collinear and one is helix. So they, they don't have a symmetry relationship between the two. So they are actually two different types of domains forming within the same material. And the J values that we get are slightly confusing because one of them is Heisenberg-like and the other one is XY-like, but they confirm to these uh, blue points, which are actually uh, highly frustrated regions straddling the, uh, the boundary between two different phases. Um, so this is the understanding that we have. Um, the further study uh, studies actually uh, have to be on single crystals to actually determine what type of excitations are those, if they are actually two-dimensional or if they are uh, in some way related to uh, quantum spin liquid-like excitations uh, that has to follow. We have not, we are, uh, we have not done those follow-up work yet. But whatever I spoke to you today is published uh, and you can find the details in this, uh, this uh, paper, which we published in uh, Physical Review B in 2018. Um, this is all I have to share with you and uh, I'll stop sharing now and 
get back to the session.